Adam State College. Great stories begin here. This is all mine. Okay. Well, happy midday and uh, welcome to our third annual, uh, fourth annual MLK Week, actually. I lost count. And so, on behalf of President Savaldi, uh, the Office of Academic Affairs, the Grizzly Activity Board, uh, the um, Department of History, Government, Philosophy, and uh, uh, Science and Mathematics for providing the pizza. Welcome all. Uh, one of the things that I find rather heartening, and if you know me very well, you know that I find few things very heartening, but I do find this heartening, um, is listening uh, to and observing the welter of Martin Luther King Day activities and the general tenor by which they are conducted. I can assure you that when we had the first Martin Luther King Day that that was not exactly the case. It was highly controversial and enough controversy that politically various states opted out of observing Dr. King Day. And when Dr. King was alive, his presence uh, was considered polarizing by many. And it seems today now that the dissenters and the people who are frustrated with, with Dr. King, if they're not in an absolute minority, at least when they speak out and declaim and decry Dr. King, there are voices to uh, countermand uh, the kinds of accusations that are often made against him. Dr. King, they say, was a communist, when what they mean is a code word that he threatened the status quo. It's been my privilege for several years to get to give these talks, and if you've heard them all, thank you for your patience and long suffering. Uh, <laughs> But if there is a consistent theme in the talks, and I think that there is, and that's sort of the quest to find an adequate label to describe Dr. King as who he really was, so that we can adequately understand him as a figure from the past in the United States that has some insight for our present and possible future. And so we spend a lot of time talking about the issue of memory, how Dr. King is remembered. And one of the things that I want to suggest, that the legal definition of Dr. K the Martin Luther King holiday is inadequate. Indeed, Dr. King was a civil rights leader. But that was simply one role. It is a subordinate role to a much larger role that he strove uh, to play on the stage of U.S. and world history. And indeed, the challenge of Dr. King is that some of his ideas don't fit very neatly into categories of law or ethics or morality. And that so much of Dr. King's ideas can be best understood from the vantage point of what he would describe himself as, as being, as a, as a Baptist minister. That is, there's a great deal of uh, you know, supernatural evangelicalism in King's ideas, but a kind of evangelicalism that informs what, what uh, the theologians would call social Christianity. So that's the idea of what we want to do today, what we want to accomplish. And I thought I would start with something over the top. So while you're eating pizza, I want you to understand what we're looking at. These are two shots of the Lorraine Motel. This is room 306. This is the corner uh, where Dr. King was actually shot. He was standing about where this broom is when he was shot. This man is named Theatrice Bailey. We know this guy's name. He was a United States Army veteran. He died in 1982. He's the brother of the owner of the Lorraine Motel, Wilbur Bailey. Wilbur Bailey's life, wife, Lorraine, and they modified the name to come up with Lorraine from Lorraine. That's after whom the Lorraine Motel was named. She had a heart attack minutes after this shooting. She was working the switchboard that day and she ran out, had a heart attack, and she would die on the 8th of April, 1968. But I thought about this picture because Theatrice had children and I always, Daddy, what did you do at work today? Well, I cleaned up after what James Lawson would call a crucifixion, the assassination of Dr. King. We know that he did this because this is what he's doing. 
in this photograph. And so a kind of powerful image, a testament to the violence, the racial violence in the United States in the 1960s, and the way that Dr. King died. And so maybe a kind of literary trope, trope if it took this kind of violence to kill Dr. King, what did he stand for that made people want to do this to him? Now here's a different image, the contrasting image of Dr. King, the most famous image of Dr. King. This is the March on Washington organized by a welter of civil rights organizations, the Congress of Racial Equality, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, among others, to crusade for jobs and justice. And the part of King that we like to remember most is the crusade for justice. The idea that maybe through the enactment of laws that we could make a more perfect union. We forget the part of King, fundamentally critic of the way that we reward activity in the United States and distribute wealth. But we love the message. This is King as he is finishing. Uh, he at this point is saying, free at last, free at last. And if you watch the newsreels, he'll turn. And if you were the, the camera, he will face you. And he actually winks to an, a colleague, I've got him. You know, I've, I've pulled this speech off. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty. We're free at last. And of course, this is the I Have a Dream speech where he calls for a world in which people would not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And we like to think of this as sort of a culminating point or a high point, the civil rights movement in the 1960s. But I want to suggest to you that the historical king at this point is still finding his voice. And the world in which the historical king lived in was not a particularly happy place. See the date? Just a couple of weeks after King leaves from this triumphant uh, speech before a throng of an interracial, interorganizational civil rights community, we return to Birmingham, Alabama, where a man named Robert Chambliss, who was known to his friends as Dynamite Bob, thought it would be a good way to teach those people, he had another term for them, you know the word, a lesson. So he planted dynamite in the basement of the 16th Street Avenue Baptist Church in Birmingham where the civil rights movement had been crusading for equitable treatment against Bull Connor and the city fathers in Birmingham. And these are the victims. I admire the courage of white supremacists that believe that a cause is, that they believe in is worthy of murdering children. I spared you something that I still struggle with, the autopsy photographs of Denise McNair. I can't look at them. I'll give you an idea, an image, what pieces of masonry look like when they're embedded in the skull of a 12-year-old. So when we think about the civil rights movement and we admire Dr. King and the happy vision of a better world, the people that wanted to challenge that vision would murder violently, brutally, and in a cowardly manner from stealth. Ultimately, Robert Chambliss was brought to justice. And Alabama's Attorney General Bill Baxley presided over a trial that resulted in Chambliss's conviction. But as anybody who's worked in the law and law enforcement knows, victims don't get brought back from the dead, even when you bring their murderers to justice. It wasn't a good time. This is summer of 1964, which civil rights historians remember as Freedom Summer. Uh, a biracial uh, uh, groups of young people, mostly, college students, mostly, went to the state of Mississippi, a state that Dr. King described as a desert state, sweltering in the heat of oppression and injustice. I suggest Dr. King was naive and understated the reality of Mississippi. These three gentlemen, Andrew Goodman, James Cheney, and Michael Schwerner, went by Mickey. 
picked up on a routine traffic stop on the 21st of uh, June 1964. Their bodies were found on August the 4th in a catfish pond dam on the edge of the uh, Indian Reservation there in Neshoba County, Mississippi. Their crime, disturbing the status quo, teaching people that they have rights and it's okay to register to vote. We call this Bloody Sunday. African Americans attempting to march down United States Highway 80 from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama to protest for voting rights. We often underestimate the importance of voting rights. Voting rights obviously determine who your elected officials are. It also determines who gets on juries. And in the sordid history of law enforcement in the United States and race, having people that look and have had your, look like you and have had your experiences on a jury is very important. George Corley Wallace gave an order to a guy named Al Lingo, who headed the Alabama Department of Public Safety. And this is what they did. They beat up the marchers. Their crime, exercising their First Amendment rights in order to achieve the ability to enforce their rights under the 15th Amendment, which is the right to vote without restriction on race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Now there was a second march two weeks later that Dr. King participated in, and that march would ultimately be successful. Rosa Parks would eventually join the march as it reached the outskirts of Montgomery. These are not especially happy images. It was a tough time to be Dr. King because you had an enemy. His name was J. Edgar Hoover, and he was in charge of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And he truly, truly did not like Dr. King. Those people close to J. Edgar Hoover repeatedly used the word pathological to describe Hoover's hatred, another word that they use, and I don't think it's an accidental choice, pathological hatred of Dr. King. What he tries to do in this document is say, look, we have some evidence on you that will compromise your position as a public figure. And if you don't commit suicide, we're going to make this stuff public. Included in this were wiretaps of King's conversations. There was one time an FBI agent actually got trapped under the bed in a hotel room trying to plant a bug when Dr. King showed up. Um, the Attorney General of the United States approved this kind of surveillance. So in fact, the government of the United States of America in Washington keeping tabs on King and hoping, right, that King would do the one thing left for him to do, commit suicide. I suggest the world we live in today is full of problems, but as a historian, uh, I tend to smirk when people talk about how divided things are and how violent things are today. Even in the wake of the recent tragedy in Tucson, it does not compare to the 1960s, which truly doesn't compare to the 1860s when we were killing each other by the score uh, over the issues of race and slavery. But as the civil rights movement in the southern states began to become nationwide as a phenomenon, as people attacked not just legal segregation in the south, but what's called de facto segregation outside the deep south, uh, they faced a lot of issues. Law enforcement, grinding poverty, and increasingly as the baby boomers came of age, a frustration with what appeared to be a glacial pace of social change. And so riots break out in places like Watts in Los Angeles. And you'll notice I picked this picture. This is pure propaganda. You know this. But I picked a picture that has all white law enforcement arresting all African American alleged perpetrators. But that would be a fair description of the way things worked most places. And the riots would spread from Watts to Chicago, to Detroit, and uh, Newark, New Jersey, which in 1967 could fairly be described as a war zone. 
The reason I picked that word is that when you bring armored personnel carriers and bayoneted servicemen into an area, it looks an awful lot like the Mekong Delta would have looked in 1967. In the summer of 1966, Dr. King shifted the headquarters of the Civil Rights Movement from the Deep South to Chicago. He actually moved into a slum, he and the whole family. And during the time in Chicago, King and his supporters marched in various communities for things like open housing. And of course, here, uh, in uh, Forest Park, Illinois, King, uh, somebody's hurled a brick bat at King. And of course, the protesters out in force, enforcing this message. That people who aren't white aren't welcome in certain parts of the city. You can't live there, even if you can buy the uh, property otherwise. King said of this particular experience, it was worse than anything he had experienced in the South. Interesting thing. Now I wonder why I make the juxtaposition from racism in the United States to these very famous pictures from the year 1968 in the Vietnam War. This is General Nguyen Lo An executing a member of the uh, Viet Cong. Uh, we have newsreel footage. You can see what an arterial stream looks like after a slug impacts the human cranium. And of course, this is a famous picture. You know this one, Dr. Savaldi. This is from Me My Four. This is William Calley's gift to global history. The murder of 300 women and children for the crime of Calley's getting pissed off at the difficult war in Vietnam. So my question is, what's the juxtaposition? Why the connection, civil rights at home, with the war in Vietnam abroad? For King, they were the twin expressions of a greater materialism that he rooted as the sort of core evil in the United States. The necessity of a, oppressing people at home, of holding them down socially and economically at home, while you sought to impose imperial will abroad to ensure money and markets at the expense of these people. I'm sure they would be happy to know that they died for democracy. It's interesting where human beings and human societies get to when killing people to save them makes perfect sense. Oh well. So Dr. King juxtaposed these issues and by 1967 to many people who had been erstwhile supporters. King appears a little out there. He appears a little radical. He's challenging the notion of the idea that the United States enjoys not just what we call American exceptionalism, but the United States enjoys a kind of providential blessing to act as it, as it needs to act. So let's let Dr. King talk for himself. Okay. Do we not have sound here? <laughs> we do, and I have turned it off or something. So let's, let's try this. Thank you, Matt. This is always the challenge with... Uh, being in multiple places and working. Yeah, there it is. Just turn it way up. And don't let anybody make you think that God shows America as his divine messianic force to be a solid policeman of the whole world. God has a way of standing before the nations with judgment and it seems that I can hear God saying to America, you're too arrogant. If you don't change your ways, I will rise up and break the backbone of your power. 
and I'll place it in the hands of a nation that doesn't even know my name. Be still and know that I'm God. I can imagine people in the Pentagon not wanting to hear that. <laughs> but it's an especially powerful metaphor rooted in King's reading of the Old Testament. Israel is God's chosen people. But when Israel forgot the commandments, the Philistines, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, rise up deus ex machina and smite Israel. And now it's the government in Hanoi that's doing the smiting. And so here we have King attacking racism at home, imperialism abroad, trying to organize what was called the Poor People's Campaign, a giant march on Washington to bring attention to the twin evils of imperialism and poverty and to try to demonstrate the need for some sort of collective, perhaps public response to poverty in the United States. That's what he's working on. One of the difficulties of feeling like you're responsible for things is that you can't finish one task before something else interrupts. And in February 1968, while King is planning to go to Washington, things break loose in Memphis. The sanitation workers go on strike and their strike is the culmination of a long period of frustration which I've tried to identify here on this slide in the city of Memphis which I want to suggest to you is just Mississippi on the north. Here is Vicksburg, right? Memphis is at the top of the map. This is the region known as the Mississippi Delta and the blues migrate from the Delta into Memphis and then on to Chicago. The problem is the attitudes about the status of African Americans, especially municipal workers who do the worst work the city of Memphis has to offer. The attitudes on the part of the white South in Memphis are the attitudes of the great planners in the Mississippi Delta. Let me describe to you, I see this big trash receptacle with wheels. The Memphis sanitation workers would have loved to have had one of those. If you were a sanitation worker, you walked into the backyard of a citizen in Memphis and you gathered their garbage and you put it in a tub and you carried it on your head. And these things could weigh upwards of 40 pounds, and they could be filled with rainwater and fecal material, and if the tub leaked, it ran down your back. And as you got older, the debility doing this kind of work took its toll. And you made the grand sum of 75 cents an hour. You could be a full-time employee of the city of Memphis, working as a sanitation worker, and be eligible for food stamps. Think about the logic of that, those of you that think that you can cut taxes and services and save money. You could just pay a decent wage, couldn't you? That's not the way we do things in Memphis, apparently. The sanitation workers tried an age-old tactic of the working class in the United States. They attempted to organize, to bargain collectively for better wages, better working conditions. They were frustrated as African Americans by the fact that the white sanitation workers, when the weather was bad, were paid for a full day. People of color were sent home without pay after they had walked or ridden the bus to work. Ultimately, the sanitation workers on their own were able to affiliate with the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, and they formed local number 1733. And during the year 1966, they petitioned the city for recognition as a union, as the collective bargaining agent, only to be told by Mayor Henry Loeb that collective bargaining was illegal for state workers and that the city would not recognize the union. 
The sanitation workers, in order to be able to function collectively, wanted the city to have a checkoff option on your pay stub so your union dues could be deducted automatically, a rather routine type of activity. This is technically how you pay your health insurance premium. But it was considered um, inappropriate for sanitation workers. And so these grievances festered until we had a tragic culminating event. I wanted you to know their names. If you look them up, if you read this story in a textbook, it's always two sanitation workers were crushed to death in a trash compactor. They were deacons, they were fathers, and they had names, Echo Cole and Robert Walker. They got into the back of a trash truck to escape a rainstorm when the trash compactor suddenly activated on a truck that had been reported repeatedly for having this mechanical problem. Imagine dying as a sanitation worker in a sea of garbage as a giant plunger and it crushes you out of existence. Well, the sanitation workers weren't going to take this anymore. And so on February 11th, the sanitation workers struck. And you can imagine, I would suggest the best time to have struck would have been in the summer. You can get folks' attention when the garbage starts to stink. But you have to work with what you have. And so the garbage begins to pile up, like in some third world country in Memphis, and the city holds firm. We're not going to deal with the sanitation workers because if we concede the right of these workers to a living wage, we have lost the whole ball game. Next thing you know, the college professors are going to want this. <laughs> and then where would we be? While planning the Poor People's March, Dr. King realized that Memphis provided an ideal place to demonstrate the kind of injustice that he saw as the core of racism and imperialism by going to Memphis. And it also provided a locus to test whether nonviolent protest could work on a mass scale. You could practice for going to Washington by testing things out in Memphis. Arriving in Memphis on March 18th, King gave, you can, this, there's actually uh, blurbs on, uh, uh, on YouTube, you can hear King's own voice. But he addressed the sanitation workers. Think of this scene, King, a man with a PhD, a member of the elite in African American society, addressing sanitation workers and saying, you know, you are truly the forgotten people. And by affirming you, we affirm something very important, that all labor has dignity. Powerful message. So King plans to have a march. They're going to move from the Claiborne Temple down Beale Street and then towards City Hall and protest for change. And as luck would have it, Memphis, way down in the south, had the biggest snowstorm they've ever had in March. I remember this storm as a kid. We got out of school had snowball fights. It doesn't snow much. It was new to us. But the, the snow interrupted the march. And so King had to return to Atlanta to continue to work on the Poor People's Campaign. And he returns for a march on the 28th. And this march was made famous by newsreel footage that showed young African Americans possibly connected with the march smashing storefront windows. Missing is the important context. As the marchers march, the police are on their radios saying permission to disrupt the march. The Negroes are rioting. And the call came, the radio call, permission granted. And so it was the police that waded into the march and began to push and shove marchers. Now there are people like Dr. King when he was assaulted by a Nazi who refuse to return 
violence with violence. But imagine your typical 18-year-old of any gender or any ethnicity. What is likely to happen when you push me? I will push you back. And so you really have a police riot. But in the national media, Senator Robert Byrd went on the air and said, this shows that King is a huckster. Nonviolence is just a way he gets the white people to let their guard down, and then we have riots. And in the last, what turns out to be the last week of King's life, his credibility is very much on the line. Many people in the movement say, well, King, this shows nonviolence doesn't work. He says, I have to now return to Memphis to demonstrate that it is possible to protest in such a way that you convince your adversary of the justice of your cause. And so he returns to Memphis. It's an interesting piece. I'll, I'll show you a picture of this, but I think this is the time to put this piece in. One of the reasons King was especially criticized after the 28, uh, the riot of March 28, is that he was whisked away by his aides and taken to the River Mount Hotel, a Holiday Inn, right there on the old Highway 61 as it leads into Memphis. It was considered uh, a, a nice place to stay. And so the image was of King when his own marchers are being assailed by police, hiding out in some resort. So you know the message has to be put out. Where is King going to be staying when he comes back to Memphis? He will be at the Lorraine Motel. That was out there for all to see. And we know that on the 28th, James Earl Ray left Atlanta, drove to Birmingham, purchased a Remington Model 7600 Game Master 30-06, took target practice en route to Memphis because he knows exactly where his prey is going to be because it's national news and newsworthy in light of the events of uh, March 28th. The few of you that were courageous enough last night to come out to see the, the video that we showed about the Memphis strike got to hear uh, Second, third, depending on how you count, King's most famous speech, the Bend to the Mountaintop speech, where he appears before the strikers and the community leaders um, at uh, the temple and addresses them. And in the way that human beings construct things, it's as if King almost knows he's about to be killed immediately and he's just trying to deal with his own fear. As we think about time living it forward, there are many threats against King. He knows that death is imminent. He doesn't know it's going to be April the 4th. But on April the 4th, as King is preparing to go to dinner, he comes outside of room 306 and he's talking with people. He's actually bent over the railing on the second floor of the Lorraine Motel and to help you. Uh, in a lot of motels, we build a block of buildings that are the 100s, then we build the 200s, then the third, floor, the, you know, the 300 block. It doesn't refer to floors, it just refers to building blocks. He's standing outside of room 306, and he's bent over, and hence the rifle shot from Ray can enter the left, uh, the, the right cheek, and actually go straight to King's spine, and it actually tumbles down and almost comes out the chest. Uh, he was dead immediately. It's a rifle shot, by the way, for your conspiratorially minded people that virtually anyone who had been in the United States Army can make. It's an easy shot from a boarding house window with a rifle with a scope. And the human head is a big target when you look at it through a scope. And so King was assassinated and died, pronounced dead, uh, at about uh, six, uh, six, 
uh, 45 uh, at St. Joseph's Hospital in, uh, in Memphis on, uh, on, the, on the 4th. The strike continues, and I want you to see something here. You see the point I want to make? Imagine being the widow of Dr. King and going back to lead the march before you buried your husband. And when you read what the press said about her that day, you might understand my emotion a little bit. Dr. King was buried in Atlanta on April the 9th, seven days later. The union finally gets its wages and its check off. And so, a happy ending, but not really. You see, what do you think happened to the sanitation workers after we got wage increases? Any ideas? We made the cost of collecting garbage more than it was, so what do we do as city officials? Mechanize the process. Interesting kind of phenomenon. This is from the Bend to the Mountaintop speech. We'll come back to that notion of the Jericho Road. Here are striking uh, sanitation workers. And you notice how, as an African American, you had to dress up you know, when you went out in, in public, uh, so people didn't think you were a vagrant. And you can see how scary peaceful picketers are. These are armored personnel carriers. And they have automatic weapons <coughs> mounted. Clearly these are dangerous men. And perhaps what makes them dangerous, their insistence. The sign says, I am a man. I remember a few years ago showing this to some students and one person that trained just the way we train people. Isn't that sexist? Okay. There's always so much work to be done. <laughs> they were insisting that they were human beings and not objects and not animals. And they were entitled to an elemental assumption of human dignity. It was a powerful slogan, so powerful that King put it in his last speech, right? He loved, I, have a, I am a man. He said, you've straightened your back. A person's hard to ride unless their back is bent. Powerful thing. Here's the Lorraine Motel and the, this building, I, I found, this is the best I could do. The building has been remodeled. This is the old Rivermont uh, where King stayed in, in March of 68. And this is the Lorraine Motel in Memphis. Um, just one of those things. The next day, a, a biracial coalition after King's assassination, a biracial coalition met with Mayor Henry Loeb. And I want you to see this piece. He's a smart guy, scholarship student to Brown, and an ardent defender of the racial status quo. So the idea that education makes you egalitarian is open to question on this point. And you'll notice this is a sawed-off shotgun. This is how six-foot-five Henry Loeb does business. But he's been trumped. Right? He knows what happened to Dallas and what happened to Birmingham due to violence in the 60s. Those cities suffered economically. And so now, he doesn't want the same thing to happen in Memphis. And so here's the famous uh, shot. We're moving from west to east down Auburn Avenue in Atlanta, Georgia. And one of the coolest things they did is they carry King's body in the common wagon that would have been the symbol of transportation in the Jim Crow era to lay his body to rest on the east lawn of the Ebenezer Baptist Church, which is now a big reflecting pool uh, at what's called the King Center for Nonviolent Social Change. When King went to Memphis, he told a story. He said, the Jericho Road is a dangerous road. 
Now, if you grew up going to Sunday school, you know this story from the Gospel of Luke. A certain man went from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among thieves. It's the story of the Good Samaritan. But we miss, when we think about the story, the Gospel writer's point and Dr. King's point. A very smart person, wanting to appear smart and righteous, said to Jesus of Nazareth, Who is my neighbor? And so Jesus of Nazareth told the story of a man who fell among thieves, and the Levite passed, and the priest passed, and it was the despised Samaritan who rendered aid and assistance. And so the answer to the question, who is my neighbor, was not, your neighbor is that. The question, who is my neighbor, was answered with a command. You be neighbor. And so as we think about the life of Dr. King and the Jericho Road is a dangerous place. It is a dangerous thing when you attempt to do good to challenge the status quo. People might shun you. They might even kill you. But you wonder what would happen to sanitation workers in Memphis or to poor people anywhere if no one stood up to be neighbor. So when I think about what Dr. King may have been all about, I like this idea of being neighbor even when it's hard and even when it's inconvenient. Because if you don't stop to help, what will happen to those who are in need of help? So, at this point, we do this every year, give you an opportunity to, to comment, ask questions, uh, uh, or whatever, and, and then you can go back to class or work or whatever it is that you're doing. Do the white sanitation workers um, unite with the... Virtually none. This was a, all African Americans, even though they're affiliated with the AFL-CIO, and there are some people who are AFL-CIO members, but they're not part of Local 1733. So it's one of those, it, it's absolutely a racial issue. And what King was trying to suggest is that the forces that keep white people poor keep black people poorer, but everybody's destitute. Yes? Other stuff. Oh. Yes, Stuart. It was uh, <coughs> watching the Jeffersons. <laughs> and, and, you know, now, with, I mean, with, you could see all those old sitcoms. Right, uh, right. Rewinds, or reruns. But, uh, you know, it seems to me that in the 70s, there was this popular discourse about race in this country. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of up front and out in the open. But that's completely gone, well not completely gone, yeah. maybe, but it seems that it's subsided. Would you say it's because, you know, the conservatism of the Reagan years or the sense that a lot of Americans believe that well, those problems have been fixed now. And I think it's a lot of those things. And first, let me suggest that, you know, you, you're talking about a lot of experimental television, right? Like All in the Family and the right. Jeffersons that are watched by many people, but that's not the whole television menu. We're also watching Gunsmoke. But there is that piece. And if you think about it, when I was a kid, it was really chic. It was a way to piss off your parents, to wear platform shoes, and to adopt the accent and mannerisms of stereotypical African Americans from television. And, and, and so there is this time, this is the time, the one period when if you look at enrollment, public school desegregation appears to be working before white flight and the creation of private academies. But obviously, at the end of the, really beginning in 1968 with uh, Richard Nixon's Southern strategy, there is the idea that you can hold political power by appearing to the, appealing to the fears and prejudices of Southern whites and getting them to vote Republican, that you can connect the racial disharmony with other fears, abortion, and those crazy women getting out of the home, and all of these other changes that were very disconcerting to people, so that by the time we get 
to the uh, to 1980 and we've had the economic stagflation of the 1970s you can commodify a message that says we've created a world where there's legal equality everything else is just way too much and it doesn't work it cost us the war in Vietnam you know you can make those kinds of arguments that to people who are facing the challenges we had bad economic times in 80 81 and 82 uh, are, are, are willing to believe because it's convenient to do so so that's you know, a good question. Other stuff. Yes, ma'am. So where do you think we're at today? I'm so glad somebody asked that question because I actually, I, this is the best answer that I can come up with today. I want to tell you that I believe we have made tremendous strides. And listen to the whole thing. We have made tremendous strides. We are not lynching people on the average of three a month which is what we did in the 1920s for the crime of being black. We have thousands of African-American elected officials, an expanded African-American middle class. There is a tremendous amount of change, and here's the but. The main reason I can say that is that the baseline is so egregiously low as to be obscene. We are much better only because it didn't take much to be better. So, that's what I would say. I did think about that. <laughs> yes? Show of hands from the audience. Who here is not faculty, staff, administration? Your students. All right. Way to go, guys. Yeah. <laughs> African American in the audience. Right. What does that say about our campus? Yeah. That's a really good question. Yeah, right. How are you? Welcome back. Oh, thank you very much. I had a great trip to Memphis and Atlanta and, and Wave Tides and some of the places that you photographed there. Um, you, you made mention of a statement when you were talking about um, nonviolent activity and how the success of nonviolent activity was making an advocate out of your enemy. You put it much more right. eloquently, and I was wondering right. if you could uh, reiterate that. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is the whole piece. I mean, you know, th this is the amazing thing about the charge of King being a communist. When you listen to his speeches, he's talking about, this is his phrase, to redeem the soul of America. Religious language focused on making this a better place. Because King believed that the damage done by racism, obviously to the victim group, but also to the victimizer. It's a toxin. It's a soul-killing lethality. And so what you tried to do was to confront people with the banality of what they're trying to do. Turning fire hoses on 10-year-old girls is never right, even if it's to maintain the racial status quo. You can look at this and know something's wrong with the system by the amount of evil that's used to maintain the system. So we're going to force you to act badly to, in order to confront you with the fundamental nature of that injustice. So that's sort of the core of, of King's approach to nonviolent social change. So uh, I'm wondering, much like Logan, as I look around the room, if, if maybe we haven't made advocates out of our initial enemies. <sighs> <laughs> you know, I, I, in, in light of current events, and I'm thinking about the school, the gun-toting school board member in Greenlee. Obviously, when a school board member uses a public forum to make demonstrably false allegations against a person, it's distressing. What was heartening were the ten to one voices of erstwhile adversaries who become allies. Yes, we can see now, after the crucifixion, we can see now that Dr. King was on to something. That if we don't all, as Dr. King said, the choice is not between violence and nonviolence, the choice is between nonviolence and non-existence. You know, we can see the truth of that message. And so lots of people, 
All right. I can, my first uh, j job with the Southern Poverty Law Center was investigating a Klan attempt to break up a civil rights march uh, on Martin Luther King Day. That hasn't happened in 25 years. Not since. And, you know, it helped that it cost people money. So I think there has been some, some important movement. And I think that, the, you know, the remaining piece is to find those other issues and ways uh, effectively to create allies out of adversaries, which we don't do when we speak stridently. And we don't do when we posture a kind of moral superiority, which is, in all cases, is nearly, is nearly always false, but it's always off-putting. Yeah. Just bad manners, my mother might say. Okay. Thank you so much for coming. Adams State College, great stories begin here.